Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Ray Offenheiser, the director of the Pulte Institute for Global Development here at the University of Notre Dame. On behalf of our entire team here at the Pulte Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to Beyond the Border, the realities of migration from Central America. This series is part of a larger program we launched with ThinkMD earlier this year called Conversations on Poverty and Inequality. Through this program, we're hoping to bring to light the different ways that poverty and inequality present themselves across the globe. The topic of migration is of particular interest to our efforts to bridge the gap between research and policy. Recently, here at the Pulte Institute, we created the Central America Research Alliance, or CARA, to build a partnership network that focuses on evidence-based advocacy across the Central America region. Our goal with this series, and more broadly with CARA, is to use evidence to put is the issue of migration and development in the region into context, and to give special priority to marginalized voices from the region. The Pulte Institute has partnered with the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, one of our sister institutes here at the Kellogg School of Global Affairs, to bring these discussions to life through the lens of integral human developments. By making these issues surrounding migration more accessible, we hope we can spur action for meaningful change. And now I'd like to welcome our host, Tom Hare, Dr. Tom Hare is a senior researcher and co-director of the Central America Research Alliance, or CARA, here at the Pulte Institute for Global Development here at, in the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Hare has worked in and on Central America for the last 20 years, where he has developed, implemented, and evaluated international development programs, particularly with a focus on law and human rights. His experience in design, implementation, and evaluation of international development programs includes work with the Department of State, U.S. Agency for International Development, the United Nations, corporations, and private donors. He's also the author of a book entitled Zonas Peligrosas, about the challenge of creating safe neighborhoods in Central America, as well as several peer-reviewed book chapters, as well as articles. He holds a master's degree in development management and policy from Georgetown University and the Universidad Nacional San Martin in Argentina, and a doctorate in public policy analysis from St. Louis University in St. Louis. Dr. Hare will be the moderator of today's discussion. But before I turn it over um, to Dr. Hare, I'd like to ask him, how did you actually get involved in research and work on Central America in the first place, Tom? Maybe you could give us a few thoughts and reflections on the beginnings of your engagement with the region. So over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ray. And for those of you who don't know Ray, he has actively supported civil society in Central America since well before my time, not to date him too much. So a special thank you to him for his example and, and dedication to the region over, over decades. But as for me, I first experienced Central America as an exchange student at the University of Central America in San Salvador. And I vividly remember riding the bus from Mexico through Guatemala to San, to San Salvador on that first trip. Basically, I was doing the typical migration route, but in reverse passing volcanoes, farms, cities, and people going about their daily lives. I was just taking in the beauty of it all from the bus window. And I knew there, there was something special about the region then, uh, but I only realized why after I became friends with students and others in some of the most marginalized communities around San Salvador. The program I studied with was based on a model of accompaniment and solidarity. So in addition to going to classes, we spent a couple of full days each week with a community just outside of the city. It was there that I met friends that I stay in touch with and visit still today, 20 years later. That experience formed me in a way that few others in my life have. It made me curious to know more, to learn more, relate more, and eventually do more. I think that is what led me here today, getting to know people and caring for them as friends, loving them as family, and then seeking to use my time, education, and experience to advocate for and with them. So en enough about me. Over the next few weeks, I'm excited to bring together some of the smartest, most dedicated people I know to discuss Central America with you all, including one of the first people I met when I stepped off the bus in San Salvador 20 years ago. I'll introduce you to her next week when we focus on voices from the region. But today, we will focus on the current reality in Central America and why people migrate. Then we will hear those voices from the region next week. And in the final session in the series, we'll focus on responses and action. 
So we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, but before I introduce today's guest, let me do a couple of uh, housekeeping items as well. You will have noticed by now that we're not in a webinar, and those who are familiar with Think ND know that we typically don't do a webinar format. We're in a normal Zoom to facilitate dialogue at the end of the, this session. So please remain on mute until then. And we ask that you use the chat function to submit any questions you may have for our speakers. And we'll do our best to address as many questions as time allows uh, toward the end. Also, by now, you should have received links to some background information on Central America. If you have not had a chance to review them, I invite you to especially view the short video that provides some important context that we will not be able to cover today. Please let our organizers know if you have any questions about finding those links. Also, it bears noting that the topic of migration can be a lightning rod for debate and entrenched views. Our purpose here today and over the next few weeks is not to convince you of one viewpoint or another, but rather to inform and discuss openly. I believe that debates are healthiest when we present evidence and find some common ground. And given our positions at a Catholic research and teaching institution, this is nothing new, but I encourage us to be open to each other's viewpoints throughout the series. Finally, you will note that the program is intentionally titled Beyond the Border. And while we cannot ignore the real challenges of security and human rights at the US border, including the recent influx of and response to Haitians, our focus during the series is on the Central American region and the realities that Central Americans face. Realities that are so difficult that many are forced to leave their homes in search of a better life elsewhere. I think we can all agree that promoting flourishing in the region is in everyone's best interest. So one final item before we launch into our discussion with our guests today. I'd like to get a sense for our audience. And to, to do that, we're going to do a quick poll before I introduce the guests. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen now, and you can go ahead and answer those questions um, as, as we go through them. And remember, these are anonymous, so please be honest to the ones that ask about your perceptions. The first question is, how often do you choose to read or listen to news about migration? And this means how often do you actually stop and read and listen or listen versus just seeing it or hearing about it in passing? The second question is, which of the following is not a current president of a Central American country? Test your knowledge a little bit today. Four choices, one of them is not a Central American president. No fair Googling while we're doing this. Number three, According to Pew Research, which country is responsible for the most visitors to the United States who overstay their visa? Which of those four countries has the most to overstay their visa? Number four, where would you put your perspective on immigration to the United States on a scale from one to 10? One being we should have closed borders and no new immigration to the country. Five or the middle is you're not quite sure one way or the other. And 10 is that we should have open borders where everyone is welcome. And number five is the last question. In a national survey conducted in Honduras, by the Pulte Institute, the top two reasons for having migration intentions were economic conditions and violence. What was the third most frequent response? So take a, another minute to fill that out. Got about a little over half of you have completed it now. Of 
about another 30 seconds. We're up to three quarters almost. All right, so now um, let's look at, look at our responses here. Um, how often people choose to read or listen to news? Um, it's about once, a, the majority is once a week. Um, for those of us, most two thirds of us, um, about once a week or even once a day, another quarter. So pretty, pretty informed crowd here. Um, which of the following is not a current president of a Central American country? Now, the interesting thing is there's a couple of unique names here. Um, and actually, it's Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. He is the president of Mexico. Um, so that's uh, a bit of a trick question there. But um, we have Juan Orlando Hernandez in Honduras, Nayib Bukele in El Salvador, and Alejandro Tiamati in Guatemala. Number three, uh, which country is responsible for the most visitors to the United States? So we fooled about half of you. It is Canada. Canada has the most visitors who overstay their visa um, compared to other countries in, in Pew's research. Um, and then your perspective on a scale from one to 10. It seems like we're, you know, a good, good number of us aren't quite sure um, and others are leaning towards, uh, we more open borders or at least processes, legal processes by which we could have uh, more immigration in the country. Spread out among that, that top half there. Um, and then here, this is uh, the, the top two reasons were economic reasons for having migration intentions and violence. Um, family reunification is always very important, but actually the third most frequent response we got was climate change. Um, and this is maybe a bit particular to Honduras, but Honduras and Guatemala both, maybe to a lesser extent, but still important in El Salvador. Um, recent strong hurricanes have been passing through and more frequent cycles of, of drought. So climate change is now, for the first time to my knowledge, um, ranking pretty high among reasons uh, people have for wanting to migrate. So thanks for participating in that. I hope educational is informative for me to, to see where everybody's at. So now on to our guests today to discuss the realities in Central America. I'm pleased to be joined by two colleagues from Notre Dame, from Notre Dame for this session. Dr. Estela Rivero Fuentes is the Monitoring Evaluation, Learning and Knowledge Management Director for the U.S. Agency for International Development funded Supporting Holistic and Actionable Research and Education or SHARE program. And she's also my co-director at the Central America, Central America Research Alliance. So she has a lot of on her plate. She's a social demographer by trade, and she spent over 20 years um, evaluating social programs in Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. And she has experience conducting research on gender, migration, youth, and violence. And I can testify that her excellent quantitative and qualitative skills combined with her extensive experience and innovative creativity have been instrumental for teams seeking to improve social interventions and programs in the region and elsewhere. We're also joined today by Dr. Abby Cordova, who's an associate professor of global affairs in the Keough School of Global Affairs at, here at Notre Dame. She's a faculty fellow in the Kellogg Institute for International Studies and a research affiliate of the Kellogg Institute's Notre Dame Violence and Transitional Justice Lab. Dr. Cordova's research examines the consequences of inequality and marginalization for democracy, which integrates topics related to crime and violence, gender inequality, economic inequality, and international migration, and particularly in the context of Latin America and the Caribbean. Her research seeks to identify public policies that can improve the well being of disadvantaged citizens and in this way advance democratic consolidation across the world. So, we're incredibly lucky to have these two at Notre Dame, not only for their academic expertise, but especially for their application of that knowledge to improve programs and policies in challenging environments like Central America and ultimately to promote human development. So, thanks to you both for joining us. 
And Abby, I'd like to start with you. You're a political scientist and a professor of global affairs. What led you here and how did you first get interested in studying political science? Was there any key moment where you knew that this was what you wanted to focus on? Thank you so much, uh, Tom, for the invitation. It's uh, truly great to be here uh, with all of you and, and share this space. Um, I'm originally from El Salvador. I came to the United States long time ago to do my uh, graduate studies at Vanderbilt University. And then I move on to pursue an academic career as a faculty. It turns out that in 2019, uh, thanks to a visiting fellowship from the Kellogg Institute here at Notre Dame, for the first time I was able to um, be part of the Notre Dame community. And so while I was a visiting fellow here, um, a faculty position actually opened up at the QS school. And I didn't like think for a second to apply to that position. And actually last year I joined the, the faculty here at the QS school and certainly couldn't be happier uh, to be here with you all. Um, so my interest really in studying political science emerged from my experiences growing up in El Salvador, I grew up in the middle of a civil war that basically lasted more than 10 years. And that uh, truly has marked uh, my life and my um, academic trajectory. Since I was in high school, I became actually interested in studying the structural causes of violence and its consequences for democracy. And once in the academia, as I started to consolidate um, my research agenda, I quickly realized that to have a better understanding of the political consequences of violence, it was important for me to study uh, the topic through the lens of gender. So one of my um, core research agendas uh, nowadays is actually to examine how state and non-state actors contribute to reinforce gender-based violence in the context of Central America. And actually, I also examine the social and political consequences of gender-based violence, criminal violence, and so on uh, for international migration. Um, so thanks, Tom, for the invitation again. Yeah, thanks, Abby. Thanks for joining us. Now, Estella, you're a demographer and evaluation specialist at the Pulte Institute. Was there any particularly formative moment in your life that led you to this work? Yes, there was. Uh, thank you for the question, Tom. And uh, you'll see that my journey into migration studies has been as yours and as Abby's, very personal. So 24 years ago, I got to Princeton, New Jersey to pursue a PhD in demography. And for those of you who don't know Princeton, it is a tiny college town surrounded by a very rich and wide technology corridor. In 1997, the year I got there, the population of Princeton was about 15,000. I mean, compare that against the 100,000 in South Bend, so you just get an idea of the size, right? The thing is that as I started exploring the town, seeing me, uh, beyond its wideness and opening my ears, I discovered the usual voices of my countrymen, I'm Mexican, uh, in the restaurant kitchens and stacking boxes in the only supermarket in town. Now, uh, these voices were really, really low because they were backstage. I mean, they were making the town work. Um, I saw Princeton as white. So then, as I started discovering the town, I realized that it wasn't as rich and as wide as it looked. On the outskirts of the town, there were a couple of old decayed neighborhoods where less than, less than a thousand Mexicans and Guatemalans lived. My first reaction when I discovered this hidden world was, how did they get here? I mean, this town is in the middle of nowhere. And um, because of that, I decided to write my first publishable paper on the causes of migration and how gender plays into that. And since then, I have been working on the topic, trying to understand better, and as everyone on this panel, to uh, see how my uh, knowledge uh, can be put to use to better the lives of those who are coming to the US. Great, thanks, Estella. And let's stay, stay with you for a moment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, over the years, you've, you've done a lot of work on migration from that first time in, in Princeton and, and thereafter, and on, both on migration and on internal displacement in Mexico and Central America. And you just spent the better part of the, the past three years working to understand migration from Honduras in particular. What can you tell us about the reasons for the most recent influx in migration and how has your research highlighted any particular challenges? Sure. Uh, well, what a great way to continue the conversation, really. Uh, let me start by telling the audience that many of the things that I've learned on this role are through studies that you and I have conducted together, as you mentioned. Uh, now, what explains these recent influx? Early in 2021, we did a national representative survey among Honduras, and we asked them about their migration intentions. Those in the audience have already uh, received a hint of the results. But let me tell them that a representative sample means that we can reliably extrapolate the findings to the home country. We found that 50% of those we interviewed would like to migrate within the next three years, with two in every five wanting to move to the US. When we asked them uh, what were the reasons for wanting to leave their country, a little more than nine in every 10 told us that they have economic motives. I mean, that's almost everyone. What is really interesting to see, as you can uh, see in the figure, is that that was not the only cause uh, that they gave. People have multiple motives. In addition to the economic reasons, half of them said that they wanted to leave because of violence, and a little less than that, that they wanted to leave Honduras because of environmental and political reasons. While one in every three also mentioned that they want to migrate because of family reasons. And uh, we can stop showing the, the figure now, Heather, thank you. So thanks, thanks Estelle. And, and so they could choose multiple reasons um, and they did choose multiple reasons. Um, and so we could say that it is not just economic reasons or violence reasons mm -hmm. alone, you know, these so-called root causes uh, that are, you know, helpful in that it helps encapsulates an issue, but it, it really almost oversimplifies. Um, because there really are numerous interrelated factors that influence migration intentions. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Uh, I mean, that's one actually of the challenges when you try to understand migration, uh, especially because these causes may change over time. So we have found, for example, that by comparing these kind of surveys over time and uh, and also in some other studies where we have followed people, especially Jews, uh, for at least six months, the importance of each of these factors has been changing. Uh, for example, in the evaluation uh, of a vocational training program in Honduras, we interviewed participants at the beginning of the program in 2019 and then six months later. The first time we interviewed them, they say that they wanted to migrate because they did not have a job. When we re-interviewed them, unemployment was still the main reason for wanting to migrate, but feeling unsafe because of violence and the idea that even when they have a job, they've earned more in the US has become very important as well. So uh, this points to how people change their motivations if they are not uh, in a good, uh, position uh, skill and uh, in the, or thriving in their country and uh, how the role of poverty, unemployment, and bad quality jobs and insecurity can play over time. Great, thanks. Yeah, I think it was really instructive to me when we saw the results mm -hmm. from that and, and we saw the shift from. The, the large number, it was still a large number who said they had economic reasons, but maybe they did find that job. And then, you know, something unfortunately happened to them or a family member or somebody in the community. And so that meant that then violence was the next reason. And so I think it 
it really informs the challenge of how do we really deal with this in a, in a holistic and systematic way um, versus, you know, it, almost the easy response, even though it's hard to do of, okay, let's just get everybody jobs, right? So, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as, as we go on. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll switch over to Abby, um, because Abby, you've dedicated a lot of your time to helping unpack the root causes of migration, you know, on the economic side, the political side, but then especially on the violence side and, and a, a form of violence, gender-based violence in particular. Could you just tell us a little bit more about how prevalent is gender-based violence in Central America and what role does it play in migration intentions? Thanks, uh, an excellent question. Another uh, really good question um, and complicated to answer as well. Um, but let me just start by saying that in general, across the world, gender-based violence is more prevalent in Africa and Latin America. And to examine actually the incidence of gender-based violence, one of the unfortunate indicators that, that we can take a look is the killing of women uh, due to their gender or femicide rates. So I look up some data and according to the most recent data from the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, unfortunately, um, the two countries in Latin America with the highest femicide rates uh, in first place is Honduras and followed by El Salvador. And so my research has mainly focused on El Salvador in the case of El Salvador, if we look at other indicators um, of, of gender-based violence, we can see that in a recent survey carried out in 2019 by government institutions actually revealed that over 63% over of women in the country report having experienced um, sexual violence at some point in their lives. Um, domestic violence is also really pervasive um, in the country with at least 50% of women experiencing violence in their home. So in my ongoing uh, book project, um, I find that the prevalence of violence against women specifically is actually the highest in areas controlled by guns, but that in these areas um, it's not only guns who are committing sexual violence against women or targeting women, but what I find with quantitative data is that also members of the police and the military are perpetrating sexual violence against women in those areas controlled by guns. And so in other words, the militarization of gun control zones in El Salvador has also contributed to gender-based violence. In these, what typically we see that are called like hot zones or you know, dangerous areas, I mean, that are kind of stigmatized that way. What we really find is this confluence of different types of violence uh, perpetrated by non-state actors and by um, state actors as well. So my research shows that this high level of impunity is precisely um, what in a way motivates um, women uh, to, to want to migrate, I mean, when they live in this context. Um, so the end result is that the threat of violence back home is even more a critical motivating factor for women to migrate to the United States because of the multiple forms of violence that they experience and sexual violence in particular. And that is compared to men. So I would like to, to show a, a graph um, just to, to illustrate um, how violence in general affects uh, women. And so when migrants are returned back to El Salvador after being apprehended at the border and asked why they migrated to start with, um, what we can see in the graph is that a higher percentage of women represented by the red line have consistently over the past uh, seven years, um, they have consistently been more likely to actually uh, cite insecurity as the main reason for migrating compared to men. In the graph, I mean, we can also see that last year during the pandemic, the percentage of both men and women citing insecurity as the reason for migrating went up. So even though economic reasons is the number one 
uh, factor, as Estela mentioned in the case of Honduras, it's also the case in El Salvador, but certainly over time, we are seeing that a higher percentage are living in El Salvador due to violence and women in particular. Thanks, Don. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Abby. That's really, really interesting. And, and one of the things that we saw in Honduras um, in our survey that, that Estella mentioned was that people, um, when we were asking about people, people's perception of gender-based violence, they said that they would the, the majority said that they would actually report it to the police. Um, and, and that was if they saw it in their home. So that wouldn't be the case of, you know, the police, um, the police actually committing the crime. And that was just in a survey. Um, so I wonder though, like in practice, have you seen, do people actually report gender-based violence when it's happening in their home or in their community? Um, or are there data available on that? Thanks, Tom. That's a great question and actually touches on an important component of my book project. So what I do find is that um, the probability of saying that actually people reported the violence that they experienced, it depends on the conditions in the neighborhood where you live, if the neighborhood is controlled or not by guns. And mm -hmm. so what I find is that uh, people in general, I mean, citizens, both uh, men and women, um, are less likely to report to the police when they actually live in control areas. And I attribute, um, you know, that finding um, not only because obviously they are in a control zone, they, but, but also is uh, out of distrust of the police in particular, given that a lot of countries in Latin America and certainly in El Salvador have turned to the militarization of certain marginalized zones in which citizens um, report abuses by the police, including sexual violence. So in those areas is where we, where we see the lowest reporting rate of crime in gun control areas. Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's really, really unfortunate, but also informative in terms of what are the challenges for this. And it's, it's something that we'll return to today, but then also in our third session where we're talking more about the asylum process and how important it is to have reliable sources to report to and to document the crimes, because then those asylum seekers need that documentation once they get to the United States. And, and you're kind of highlighting an, an area where it's very challenging to do that because sometimes those the same people that you're asking a report from are the ones who are committing the crime. So we'll 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 come back to that because I, I think that's a, a really interesting and a really interesting point. And I think we also do have a you know plug one to keep an eye out for for your book when it comes out. And then we have a policy brief on the Pulte website that was done by one of our past fellows on gender based violence. Um, in the region and the challenges, particularly in the asylum process that the people face if they've experienced gender-based violence. So if you have an interest in, in that, um, please visit the Pulte website and you can dig into it a little bit more. Um, and, and then let's stay with you for a second, Abby. Um, you highlighted some of the, these really troubling individual experiences that lead some people to migrate. Um, but overall in the region, there's also this collective concern about the strength of democratic institutions and almost and, and not almost, but democratic decay in the region. How do these governments in the region figure into migration intentions? Are there frustrations or concerns about the state of democracy in Central America? Thanks, Tom. Um, just to provide a little bit of background. Um, if we examine the trajectory of democracy in Central America, looking at different measures uh, of democracy, what we see is that democracy, as you said, has declined sharply in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras in the past few years. And actually in the case of Nicaragua, uh, we cannot even talk about democracy anymore. Um, the country is being rated uh, as not free. So, is a region that certainly is um, in trouble politically. Um, currently, El Salvador is the country that in the region, in the region is showing the fastest decline in democracy by these uh, different indexes. Um, the government is disregarding the constitution and all the power is being concentrated in the executive. 
So this has created a lot of political uncertainty. And also um, there have been some economic measures that haven't been very wise that the government has implemented, such as the adoption of a new currency, a virtual currency or coin, the Bitcoin, which has led uh, to concerning signs of economic instability. And certainly this situation um, of uh, economic deterioration, I anticipate um, that might lead, uh, I mean, of, I hope not, but it might lead uh, to more people really wanting to migrate. Um, a survey actually conducted in August um, by the Central American University in El Salvador, UCA, asked respondents if they will intend to migrate if the adoption of the Bitcoin uh, were to undermine their economy. And almost 42% of respondents responded yes to that question. So this is certainly concerning given the signs um, that we are seeing about the decay of the economy in El Salvador. Um, but going back to the political um, environment, um, it's important to note uh, that in the context of El Salvador, unfortunately, uh, we are really seeing um, political repression against um, those considered political opponents. I mean, it, we see signs of that in actual practices of repression against those who criticize the government. And we have seen this before. I mean, and we are seeing it in Nicaragua, right? And, and, and we know what has happened in Nicaragua because of this uh, political repression. And that is more people um, wanting to migrate or actually leave in the country. So we have these uh, kind of two venues uh, you know, additional push factors that, that might lead people to migrate um, that in this political environment. And as Estela showed, uh, political motivation is also um, a reason that people side for migrating in the case of Honduras as well. So thanks, thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks, Abby, for that, that additional context. I think it is important to keep these larger state institutions in mind, right, because they play a very important role in, in providing uh, either the positive experience for citizens to express themselves and, and, and to protect human rights, and, and, and they can also work conversely. But let me turn to Estella again for the, for the next question. Estella, based on your evaluation of programs in, in Honduras and elsewhere, what works to improve these realities and decrease migration and tensions in the face of all these challenges that we've been talking about? Sure. Uh, well, I'll answer based on what we have seen works uh, within our work in Honduras. And let me start by saying that youth should be a group of a special interest in any effort to improve the quality and dignity of life. I mean, in all cases, this is almost universal, migration intentions decrease with age. In the case of Honduras, uh, what we saw is that those in the 18 to 30 old year range had 23% higher intentions of migrating than those above 31. And the unemployment and underemployment rates in that population are also much larger. Now, what works to improve living conditions? I mean, this is really about what migration is about. Uh, one key area, and it's not the only one, is to improve employment skills. But these interventions need to be paired with larger structural changes. We keep talking about the st uh, structure, right? That provide good quality, long-term employment. Um, at the Policy Institute, we recently evaluated a program that provided young people with life skills and vocational training and connected them with potential employers. The goal was not to decrease migration, but what we found is that after the intervention, the number of participants employed had increased while their migration intentions decreased. Nonetheless, when we interviewed participants six months later, many have lost their jobs. This is not only associated with migration intentions, as I mentioned before, but also with the perspectives that they see a good future in the country. So what works? Well, in this case, we show just providing employment skills and finding unemployment uh, is helpful. 
but without long-term good quality employment, that is really not news. Yeah, I think that's an, an excellent point. And maybe it's something that we've spent a lot of time on, right? Trying to dissect it and unpack um, since we hear so much about the importance of jobs and, and certainly jobs are, are important, but they're not the only way to measure economic well-being and, and, and overall well-being. But, so what you're saying, I guess, if I could summarize, is that the jobs matter, but the quality and duration of those jobs matter too, or even more, right? Absolutely. I mean, I talked about uh, before about how the reasons to migrate change uh, in this group from being unemployed to the desire to have a better paying job in the U.S. And I think that's perfect illustration that it's not only having a job, but having a good quality one that makes people flourish where they live. Another example is that in the national survey we did in Honduras, and this is not only for Jews, um, we found that about 40% of respondents were employed, but they're still food insecure. Uh, wow. We then explored how food insecurity acted in combination with not having enough income to, met and, uh, to make ends meet and unemployment to affect migration. What we found was that among those who did not suffer from food insecurity, not having enough income increased their migration intention substantially. It didn't matter if they were employed or not. Yeah. Among those suffering from food insecurity, however, employment was key. Those who were food insecure and were unemployed would have the highest migration intentions. They were really the most vulnerable, uh, both economically and in terms of uh, migration intentions. So again, this, this talks about the how complex it is, uh, the combination between poverty, the quality of job matter, uh, mat mattering, uh, but also being able to make a living out of this. And I think this is really big for the root causes of migration, how we uh, bag everything together. This, this is showing that some factors affect people, some groups more, and make them particularly more vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, and it lends itself to this sort of differentiated approach and, and the importance of, of really understanding well a, a problem before we jump in to try to solve it, right? Um, and, and who it affects and, and how it affects them. Um, so thanks for that, Estella. And we have a couple of minutes left uh, before we open it up to, for questions and answers. Um, so please continue to put your, your questions into the chat. Um, but before we do that, I, I wanna ask each of you, Estella and, and Abby, if, if you could reflect on what you've seen or found through your research. Um, and, and as I was preparing today, I was thinking about one of the more interesting reports I've read on the region and something that I've heard from friends in the region as well is this sense of that Central Americans feel an overall sense of hopelessness. Um, and so I wonder, you know, to kind of put that on its head and, and try to end at least this part, portion on a more positive note, I wonder what, what gives you hope as you conduct your research, as you engage with the region, as you engage with your friends and family in the region, and, and what does continue to concern you about the coming years in Central America? And what are the things that we should all be paying attention to? So Abby, we'll start with you. Thanks, Tom. Um, what really gives me hope is to see that many, including citizens, universities, and civil society organizations have united and really stood up and defend democracy in the region. Um, the majority of citizens continue to believe in democracy. Um, for Independence Day in Central America, this uh, past September 15th in El Salvador, Thousands of citizens stormed to the streets to participate in a peaceful protest to demand government transparency and respect for the rule of law. The, the recent survey that I mentioned uh, conducted by the Central America University UCA actually shows that um, about 96% of citizens in El Salvador demand government transparency. 
And so this shows that citizens, even if some of them voted for the incumbent, are really willing uh, to make the government accountable and not simply give it a blank check. And I think uh, that's important that people believe that um, democracy really is the only game in town uh, for a country to prosper. Um, and there are many concerning uh, trends. Obviously, one of them um, is the current um, political um, environment. And also, I would like to add, um, is concerning also to, to see again, in the particular case of El Salvador, that there is information or documentation that um, there is actually some negotiation between government and, and guns that has been reported by a journalist. And so we still uh, don't know the implications of that long term, uh, but I can continue uh, citing the, the, the concerns, but I will leave it here and I look forward to the Q&A, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Abby. And I, I think that is true, especially as we look at a place like El Salvador, where, where President Bukele, you know, enjoyed for a long time over 90 percent approval rating, which most presidents would give anything for. And, and it's I think it remains high despite some of this this democratic decay. But that, you know, on the converse, as you mentioned, this recent report, still 96 percent say, you know, we need more transparency. So they're saying we like you, we like what you're about and what you're doing. But we need you to respect, you know, the the rule of law and and have some accountability. So I think that's they're trying to thread thread a needle there, and, and hopefully they can do that um, and and continue with a strong voice. Um, now, I guess Estella, turning to you, any, anything you would add based on on your recent experiences in the region? Uh, just quickly uh, to leave uh, way to the Q and A. Uh, I really would like to end up with a positive voice. I mean. Migration is not easy. Uh, no one wants to migrate. We've seen the, the caravans and, and uh, people at the border. Uh, but one of the things that we found through our research is that when people think they have a good future in Honduras and they think that their communities are true home, they have 88% lower migration intention. Uh, so through our research, we are trying to unpack and understand what makes people feel like they have a good future in the country, how we can uh, make them flourish, and uh, how uh, what is really uh, the what are the factors that make them feel uh, like their community is their true home. So I think we uh, there's there's hope in that in people. Uh, feel like they have a future and that they can flourish where they live. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's no small challenge, um, but I think the more it's one of those, you know, it's the academics uh, sort of conundrum of the more you learn, the more you want to learn or the more you, you, you feel like you need to know. Um, and so thanks for for continuing down that path, both of you, in terms of trying to unpack this further. Um, I do see a, a, some good questions coming in. So let's dive into those with the, the time we have remaining. Um, and the first one that came early, and sorry we didn't respond to it earlier, but Estella, remind me, what proportion of the population overall in Honduras had migration intentions in the next three years? I forget the specific number, if you know that offhand. Sure. Um, what we found in the latest survey uh, is that 40% of uh, I'm sorry, 50% of them want to now have migration intentions, with 40% of them wanting to migrate to the U.S. But that, again, changes from time to time. We found uh, in some other surveys that it's about 25%. Uh, it depends uh, on the time. Yeah. This was a survey done in the, in the midst of COVID uh, and the economic, uh, well, recession brought by it. By it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the data from May indicate, you know, half of, of those surveyed have migration intentions and not all those translate to actual migration, but that's um, research does show that there is some some alignment with that. So that's a pretty significant amount when when half of your country sees a better future somewhere else and, and, and might choose to leave because of it. Um, then there's, there's another one sticking with you for a second, Estella, just on this topic of jobs and, and economic um, improvement. Um, a good question here from Allison that 
that she's heard that U.S. business women about U.S. business women trying to teach women in Central America how to start a business, and those often fail because you know businesses aren't the same between between cultures um, and those that we're trying to to provide some assistance for. Um, is is there a way that we can uh, help that? you know, and bridge those differences um, and, and things that actually work maybe and, and kind of enculturate what we're doing in the region. I guess both of you, I'd open it up to either one of you to respond to that based on what you've seen. That's a great question. Uh, and yes, that, that can be a factor. I can uh, speak of some uh, success stories uh, that I know of. Uh, Almost 50 years ago, for example, the Population Council started a project in Guatemala uh, to work with Mayan girls. Uh, it was not only an employment pro uh, project, uh, but it, it was meant to build community, uh, empower them, uh, get them uh, rooted in their community, and to uh, make uh, teach them financial skills and help them sell some of the goods they did. Uh, the program has proved to uh, get a lot of uh, good indicators uh, in terms of the number of girls employed, uh, the ones that can actually transition to having an, uh, an, enter an enterprise. And I think the key here is working collective, uh, collaboratively uh, rather than vertically. Uh, so that that that's just one of the examples I see. I mean, they, they define what that, that the enterprise and hand up look like and handcuffs look like uh, in the context of the Altiplano in, in, in Guatemala. Um, and so this can be replicated in other places. It might have been already. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of I mean one of the things I I've especially learned over the years is the importance of really you know, assessing and evaluating and, and listening and accompanying before acting, right? I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of us who have, we there have good intentions and, and maybe we have an idea of what we think will work, but we don't take the time to really ask others if they think it'll work in their context and understand what happens. I know I've learned so much through those conversations of, of what, what works, you know, here might not work somewhere else. I think we've seen a lot of this, Abby, you did a big evaluation a few years ago of, of some of the citizen security and rule of law projects that were replicated off of what was happening in Los Angeles and other places. And, and there's a lot of good that comes from that, but there are also challenges in taking those models and, and transferring them to other places. And you need to take that time. I guess my lesson learned is taking the time to adapt and modify is really important to the, to, to the success of the program. Um, and maybe this this kind of leads to the next question, um, and, and maybe for both of you, but but Abby, especially since you've done sort of a, a large evaluation in the past of the past of pa past administrations' approaches, you know, how do you see the the current Biden administration's approach towards Central America, um, and or and or and maybe Estella too, Mexico's approach. Um, towards development in the region and what opportunities for, for success do you see in there? That's from Cesar. Yes, uh, thanks uh, for that question. So um, the Biden's administration focus um, on Central America in terms of how to address um, migration is really on corruption. So reducing corruption and promoting um, democratic practices in general. And, and I think uh, that's certainly an important component because obviously if we have high levels of corruption, uh, then there is going to be even um, fewer resources to invest um, in communities in general. Uh, but also because as we were talking, um, really having uh, governments that commit to democratic governance is important also to deter uh, migration. Uh, when you have um, repressive regimes, uh, people will want to migrate, at least an important portion. And so I think that approach is, um, is important. Uh, however, I think that we need uh, to keep in mind what we have found in, in previous evaluations of what is important also uh, to address 
some of what we have been calling the root causes of, of, of migration. Um, and that is to really implement uh, programs um, that get at the local level. And when I say at the local level, from that experience that you are mentioning, uh, that study by Vanderbilt University that evaluated uh, USAID's crime prevention uh, programs in, in Central America, uh, what we learned is that to prevent uh, violence, really you have to have a community level based approach. And, uh, and I think this actually um, speaks to what Estella was saying, and, and, and that is really important for citizens uh, to feel part of their community, that they can actually engage freely without fear. And that, you know, applies to both men, women, girls, boys, everyone, right? Um, and so I think that for people, yeah, they live in a country, they live, you know, in a municipality, but the community matters a lot. So we can have these more macro approaches like corruption reduction to um, try to, to, you know, just um, make people really to be able to stay, right? Because as Stella say, said, no one really wants to leave, you know, your town, your friends, you know, your family. And so that's important, the macro approach, but really at the local level, um, more needs to be done. Great. Yeah, thanks. That's a good response. Estella, anything to add? Um, well, I agree completely with uh, Abby. Uh, corruption is important. Um, it has been identified as one of the root causes of migration. But I think throughout uh, this talk, uh, if we'll, well, at least I, I, I try, and I think Abby as well, to make a point is that root causes really oversimplify many things. And uh, and they they are so macro uh, that they don't uh, give place to understanding that the population experiences uh, these root causes differently. And uh, by sex, uh, by poverty level, by region, uh, by age, uh, and by unemployment status, and uh, so there are some, it really uh, mutes some of those interactions uh, that put some at a desperate situation um, and do not have the time to wait for a corruption to be solved and, 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 and have a cascading effect. Now, in terms of Mexico's policy, that's, that's a completely different thing. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, it, I think that that's a topic for another uh, for another talk. But uh... sure, sure, yeah. And I think we're we're getting close to our time. But one thing I would mention just on that topic is for our our third installment in this series. So two weeks from, from today, back in back. Um, we're, we'll have um, actually a representative from the U.S. Agency for International Development who's working with the administration. Um, to uh, to speak to some of this about what the U.S. government's role is, what they see as their opportunities for success, what are the challenges, um, as well as a, a representative from a business group that's doing the same thing, um, and and civil society actors. So we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about these, you know, the challenges and the, and the opportunities going forward. So. Um, and I did see one quick question about uh, where Salvadorans in particular head to within the United States. And I would just quickly mention, you know, the Washington, D.C. area, Boston and Los Angeles. Um, and and but but note that you can get a good pupusa even in, in South Bend. So, there, you know, while those are the hot centers, um, you know, you definitely see see Salvadorans anywhere you can find a, pupus, a pupuseria. So. Um, with that, um, we'll, we'll close this, this portion of the event today. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Invite you to, to join us over the next two weeks at the same time. Um, for those who are interested, and as is the format for the unique format for Think ND, uh, we'll move to breakout rooms for discussion after this. And so if you're interested in doing that, please uh, stay on and you will automatically be moved to a room for about 15 minutes. Um, and also on Think ND, we have many different resources to help you explore the concepts we've discussed. Um, so be sure to check those out. 
Uh, they're available in the reminder emails and the links that you've been sent. Um, and please feel free to share this uh, series with your friends. We're accepting reg registrations all the way throughout the program as each meeting can stand alone on its own and they, they won't be lost. They can go back and, and even watch and refer to previous materials that they want. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much to Abby and Estella for, for joining us and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And